A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, I'm Victoria Meyer. Welcome back to The Chemical Show. This week, I am speaking with George Van, who is the president of EcoServices, which is a part of EcoVist. George has 30 plus years of leadership experience in the chemical industry and an extensive background leading diverse teams in a variety of areas, commercial, manufacturing, procurement. He's worked at some leading companies that you all know, WR Grace, BASF, and Englehart. And George is also an U.S. Army veteran um, and has a BS in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech and an MBA from Georgia Southern University. So George and I are going to be having a great conversation and talking about a wide variety of things that you guys are going to find interesting. So George, welcome to The Chemical Show. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks for inviting me to join The Chemical Show. I appreciate having you here. What's your origin story? What got you interested in chemicals and what ultimately led you to where you are at EcoServices? Okay. Um, so I guess uh, I kind of got started looking at manufacturing as an exciting kind of career. Uh, I remember when I was a, a child, my father was a plant manager at a plant that made fiberglass bathtubs. And I remember one time touring it and thinking, hey, this is really cool. Uh, it just the, you know, just the process for making it, all the things that were going on, all the people doing different stuff. So I ended up going to uh, Georgia Tech uh, with a, and graduating with a mechanical engineering degree. And I went from Georgia Tech into the military for four and a half years. I, uh, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship, and that helped pay for school. And I went into the Army. And when I uh, graduated, uh, or when I finished the Army, I, I started saying, OK, now what's next? You know, where, where am I going to go? And I started looking for opportunities. And I joined Inglehard Corporation as a maintenance supervisor. So I worked in, uh, in maintenance for a while, uh, kind of graduated into operations, became a plant manager of my own. Then I moved into business roles. Uh, BSF came along uh, about 2006 time frame, bought uh, Inglehard. So I transitioned from Inglehard to BASF. I uh, worked in a variety of roles in uh, BSF, commercial roles, as well as uh, a little bit of manufacturing. And then I left BASF in 2017 and joined WR Grace as head of uh, their sales for specialty callus. We sold uh, polyolefins callus, polypropylene polyethylene callus, as well as chemical callus. And then uh, about a year ago, I was looking for kind of like, what's, what's, what's next in my career? Yeah. And... Uh, this opportunity came up with EcoVist and EcoServices, and uh, I decided that this was a, a next good uh, career progression, and I moved over to uh, EcoServices uh, August of last year. Awesome. 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 So tell us a little bit about EcoServices, because I think a lot of so, people probably don't know who they are. Yeah. So uh, EcoServices uh, is part of EcoVist. Uh, EcoVist, some people may be familiar with PQ. Uh, and PQ went through some strategic realignment back in the 2021 timeframe, 2020, 2021. Um, and it came out of uh, that realignment, rebranding itself as EcoVist. It was a, a more leaner, uh, more nimble company. And EcoVist is primarily a material science catalyst and services company. And they're two businesses within EcoVist. One is the Callus Technologies, and the other one is EcoServices. So what is EcoServices? Within EcoServices, we have kind of like four segments. We uh, produce regenerative sulfuric acid that, go, that is used in oil refineries. And then we also uh, produce virgin sulfuric acid, as well as we have a 
waste treatment section of our business where we treat hazardous waste and actually burn it in our furnaces and use the heat as part of the recovery process. And then uh, our last uh, segment is uh, callus activation, which we activate callus that's used in hydro processing and uh, renewable fuels. Ah, interesting. So it's maybe a really old school circular business in its own way. Absolutely, it is. So a lot of what we do with refineries is we take the spent sulfuric acid they use to make alkalates. They use it and then send it back to us. We basically process it and uh, increase its strength back to what is needed in the process in the refinery. They use it and send it back. So it is a circular in some way. It's a circular process. It's uh, basically an old uh, process that's been recycling sulfuric acid for years and years and years. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. All right, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But let's start with you um, and a bit of your history. So you were in the U.S. Army for four plus years. Right. Which is a which is just a, a great and actually a somewhat unique background, I think, for a lot of folks. I guess, number one, did you do anything exciting? And maybe more importantly, what did the Army teach you that you've been able to apply to business? Okay. So the exciting part, uh, so I have to, to lead with this, and people always kind of look at me with a side eye. Uh, I was stationed in Hawaii. Uh, oh, with, George. Uh, with, <laughs> 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 so that was kind of exciting in and of itself. Uh, I was with the 25th Infantry Division, uh, part, and I was in an engineer battalion, the 65th Engineer Battalion. What was interesting, though, is that battalion and that division uh, had responsibility across Asia Pacific at the time. And so we went on multiple deployments where we went to different countries from anywhere from two to six weeks working with other, uh, with the local, with the host uh, military on military exercises. So I got an opportunity to go to Korea, Japan, Thailand, Australia. And it really, that was exciting because I got to meet a lot of different new people. I got to experience new cultures and really gave me a whole new appreciation for uh, the Asian culture, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. That's interesting. It, it it wasn't enough to keep you there past your four and a half years, though, huh? Well, you, you know, in the Army, uh, in, like in some businesses, after a, few, after a few years, it's time to move. And so yeah. uh, when it was time to move, I was like, maybe it's time to do something else. Got it. So how have you applied your learnings from the army into business? What, I mean, I think that we always talk about the military being a great foundation, um, but for you, what have you seen that's been really applicable? So the thing that I, I appreciate about the, the army that was very uh, helpful and I've used ongoing since I, since I left the army and, and came into business was the importance of leadership. You know, the Army stresses uh, really does a great job of training leaders at all levels within the organization. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, if it's in the military, military leaders, don't you just give orders? Some people do. <laughs> and it's it's really not like that. I mean, in order to be effective mili uh, leader, whether it's in the military or business, you can't just use your hierarchical authority to say, I told you to go do this, go do this. You really have to understand how to work with people, how to use your influence, how to listen to different points of views and how to make the best decision. And so, you know, you take that and you can apply that regardless of what organization. So when I left the Army and went into, you know, maintenance and, and into different roles and to, to manufacturing or business roles, you know, learning what are the key important things you need to know, working with people, getting different points of view making decisions that understanding the the consequences of your decision but not you know not waiting to make a decision making a decision and then taking accountability for your actions all of those were important things that i learned in the army that i've that i've carried on since then that's pretty cool that's pretty cool i read something recently um I don't know. You know, there's been a whole lot of uh, books and other things about the power of habits and the power of routine. And one of the statements I read recently said that one of the reasons that former military uh, members and leaders are very successful in business is because they learned that power of routine and habits and stuff. Would you agree with that? Do you find that to be true for you? 
Um, I certainly think there's a level of discipline that you gain in the military that carries forward in self-discipline. I mean, it's it starts with little things like, you know, you get up early when you're in the Army, and I still get up early, you know, uh, you, you get a, a head of things. Uh, planning when you when you know whether you're going in front of a briefing or whether you're going you know going to a meeting is making sure you're you don't just walk in there not prepared. So it's it's a discipline about how you approach things that I think absolutely I think you take that from the military and you can apply it in business. Awesome. All right, so let's talk about business. So you've gone you've you've worked with a variety of companies. In some respects, they seem to have gotten progressively smaller. Like if we think about the army being the giant corporation, Englehart, right. maybe not so much, but how, what are the similarities and dis differences that you've seen as you've migrated through your career? Well, if you think about a business, just from a generic point of view, and whether you're in a really big corporation, which I've been in or smaller companies, you know, there's some things that are fundamental across multiple businesses. So, for, you know, one of the things that always comes up is, well, how are we going to grow? You know, most companies, uh, very few companies will say, I'm not growing anymore. And, you know, we're stagnant. We're just happy. You know, so how are we going to grow? Uh, you know, another thing is, well, how do I provide value to my customers? You know, what, what is it they're looking for and how can I provide value to the customer? Uh, another one that I've, I've noticed uh, particularly recently, but it's actually been around a long time, is how do you attract and retain good talent? Everybody has that on their mind, you know. Uh, talent is something that's that's always in demand. Uh, so those are some similarities between the different, you know, uh, organizations I've been associated with. If you look at differences, probably one of the biggest differences is resources. So, you know, when you're in a big company or a big organization, uh, bureaucracy like the military, you know, you've got people that can do a lot of different things and are very specialized. As you get to smaller companies, you start to wear multiple hats. You know, there's not like an expert to go see for some some that does you know something for specific. You have to like you know maybe you got your HR hat on today, and maybe you've got your uh, operations hat on today, and tomorrow you've got your strategic hat on. You know, it's not just one thing that you're doing in small organizations, and it's not that they don't have people, but they don't have lots of people, and so you've got to, everybody's got to kind of dive divvy up and get things done. Yeah. Yeah. I I would agree with that. And I've, I've gone from big to small <laughs> to tiny, uh, where, you know, where you have to hold <laughs> a lot of different hats. Um, and it's, and it's that, I mean, it's, it's fun, but there are days that you're like, isn't there somebody to hand this off to? Why is, <laughs> why is this come to me? Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I sure wish there would be somebody else who could help me with this. <laughs> well, that somebody else is you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, post pandemic 2022 and 23 has probably been more challenging than a lot of people anticipated. Um, I think we knew that, you know, there was going to be some slowdown in business, but it's, it's been different, right? It's been a different couple of years. How are the events of the past year? When you look at the Russia, Ukraine war, inflationary pr uh, pressures, et cetera, how are they affecting eco services? So, um, it, we're in a good spot in terms of our business model because we're, although I, you know, we produce and we sell sulfuric acid, really we're more of a service industry or service business model, kind of like industrial gases. Yeah. And so in that vein, we're not as, uh, we're more resilient in tough and challenging economic times than, I mean, you can, you can have huge windfalls or it can be, you know, feast or famine. So with with our business, 2022 uh, overall was a good year because there was strong demand across multiple industries or multiple markets that we service. Um, we've come out of the pandemic in, in a pretty good uh, position. Uh, during the pandemic, just like everyone else, things were kind of slow and everybody kind of slowed down. But now uh, we feel we'll be right back. At EcoVist, they're accelerating the transition to a sustainability-driven future. Their long history of innovation, expertise, and customer collaboration supports the development of proprietary catalysts and services across their two industry-leading businesses, advanced materials and catalysts, and eco-services. 
Advanced Materials and Catalysts is a leader in proprietary and customized technologies for polymers, cleaner fuels, emissions control, and circularity. EcoServices is the largest North American recycler of spent sulfuric acid. EcoVist, your catalyst for positive change. Like we're positioned well for growth for the future. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and, and are there specific tactics or approaches that you find, you know, basically you've learned at Eco Services or you've applied from your career that you guys take to shore up business during these slower at times or, you know, as they start speeding up? So one of the things that's kind of important for our business is uh, we have long term relationships with our customers. And uh, that's important that that kind of helps mitigate some of the, you know, uh, more challenging economic times. And so these long term uh, relationships, we do that based on having long term contracts. And that helps that that's that's two ways, you know, then refineries can know that they can depend on us. You know, we're there every day, you know, refineries run 365 days. So do we. They know they can depend on us and we know we can depend on that customer. So I would say, you know, long-term relationships and continuing to develop those relationships with customers and then long-term contracts to support those relationships. Those are critical areas for us as we look to, you know, weather any economic storms and also for the growth for the future. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So when you think about the future, a lot of your business is tied to refineries. And, uh, you know, I think everybody's got a bit of a question about what is the future of refineries when we look at the um, this push towards electrification and electric vehicles and stuff. How are you looking at that? Or what are you guys seeing from where you sit today? So um, we're kind of in a unique position because we straddle some of the more traditional mature industries like refining. And we also support some of the emerging technologies or the, the technologies that are getting more focused like more renewable fuels and electrification. So first, from the refining standpoint, uh, we think there's still a long runway for refineries, for refined products. Uh, there's still a lot of internal combustion engines out there on the road, you know, and they're not going away, you know, in the next five years. At the same time, there's there is an ongoing push that will continue for cleaner burning fuels. And so when refineries need to be able to blend stock to get those uh, lower emissions and cleaner burning fuels, they use alkali. And alkali is, is made through using sulfuric acid as part of the process. And so that's not going away. Uh, we think there's a long runway with that. And then so that's on the mature side. On the emerging side, you know, as, as we go more and more toward electrification, you know, there's demand for things like copper. Uh, copper is a lot. There's a lot of uh, news around, you know, the copper demand. Well, in copper mining, they use sulfuric acid. Uh, and sulfuric acid is important in the processing of extracting the ore from uh, the copper from the ore. So all of this is where we can have a nice balance between mature industries that we think are still going to have a long runway and the new emerging industries where there's things like uh, renewable fuels, uh, mining, battery production uh, that we'll, we'll see much longer in the future. Yeah, it's interesting. So you'll be adapting your business to meet some of these new markets and market demands, but you, you see continued potential and potential yes. growth. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. we are looking at what's the shift. You know, we're looking at okay, yeah. how does it shift and being prepared. So as there may be a decline in gasoline consumption, for instance, we look at how we can transition to more increased uh, virgin acid production. Yeah. So I mean, we've we touched on uh, circularity, and in fact, you guys have in many ways a fairly circular business in the sense that you're regenerating products and that you you're using. Uh, not just virgin sulfuric acid, but repurposed or cleaned up. I know you have a better word for that, sulfuric acid. Um, how, what, you know, how do you guys see circularity? How do your stakeholders see you? Do you, are you under pressure as it relates to this? Do you feel like your, your narrative is well understood in terms of the fact that it's not just kind of this old stinky, dirty industry, but that you've actually are, um, having a circular business, it is a sustainable process and it is supportive of these new technologies. 
So uh, I would say sustainability is a, a critical part of, you know, what we're trying to communicate to, you know, the investment community, as well as to our customers, as well as to our employees. Uh, recently, we were awarded uh, Ecovadis' gold certification. Congratulations. Uh, which, That's uh, a big you know, deal. Thank, thank you. Yeah, it is a big deal. And, you know, that kind of set, it kind of shows that we're committed to sustainability and to being a more sustainable company. At the same time, like I mentioned, we're looking at, okay, how do our businesses, both Catalyst and Eco Services, contribute to existing sustainable practices as well as sustainable practices in the future? And so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we're involved with the recycling or uh, recovery of spent sulfuric acid. Which, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. If we didn't do that, all that acid would have to be disposed of, probably through a deep injection well, by recovering it and, and reusing it again. So it's really getting the message out that even, quote, industries that are mature that, you know, may not have as, uh, as interesting a, uh, a technology really have a part in sustainability practices going forward. Yeah. Does this become part of your employee value proposition? So we we started talking, I know you referenced that talent um, and, and finding the right people is a bit challenging, right? And I think we see this across the chemical industry, um, aging workforce, a desire for more hybrid working, maybe a bit of a disdain for these old industries, what are you in eco services seeing as it relates to talent and availability? So um, we talked about that uh, earlier on around the importance of talent and, you know, having not only attracting, but you also want to retain because, you know, you don't want them just come in the door. You don't want to get great talent and they leave two years later, go someplace else. Um, I think uh, technical, uh, technically degreed uh individuals are at a premium, you know, whether it's engineers, chemists, uh, anyone with some type of technical degree is at a premium. There's also a premium for uh, highly skilled vocational type trades. So, you know, think about mechanics, think about welders, think about uh, I and E technicians, instrument and electric, electric technicians. All of those are important in uh, manufacturing in industrial industries. Okay. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, whether it's your big oil companies or your petrochemical companies or a smaller company like us, we're all fighting for the same talent. So you mentioned a value proposition. You have to kind of create a value proposition that says, okay, why would I want to come for, to work for a smaller company like Ecovist, Eco Services, versus working for a big, you know, ExxonMobil? And so the things that we try to do is create a, a, a unique value proposition uh, that says, you know, there are things that you can do and experience with a smaller company that you it may take you years to experience with a bigger company. And at the same time, you can have an immediate impact on the bottom line where you may get lost in uh, as a number in a really, really big corporation. Yeah. Do you see that there's a potential for faster progression in a smaller company? There can be. I think that what, what we look at and what uh, candidates uh, try to balance out is there may be opportunity for faster progression, but there may not be as many opportunities. So for instance, if you're in a really large company, you know, maybe I can go to a location, you know, one of a hundred different locations. Well, we don't have 100 different locations. So, yes, there's opportunity for advancement, but it's not going to be the same as with a really big company. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I think it just depends on, I mean, uh, people's perspectives in terms of what they value um, from a work style, work-life balance um, impact, as you say, right? So because there's this aspect of how much impact can you make and it differs. Yes. And, and in a small company, and, and Victoria, I know you know this, in a small company, individuals make a very big impact. You know, it does. It's, uh, it's when you're a bigger company, sometimes people scratch their head and they say, OK, I know this is important, but how does this impact, you know, the bottom line? It's it, you don't have to worry about that in a small company. You know exactly yeah. what you're doing makes an impact. 
Yeah. So I think what's interesting is um, you talked about, we've got the technically degree talent and it seems like, and I've got kids in college and who are doing engineering and computer sciences, STEM-based um, programs. And there seems to be a ton of growth, right? I keep, you know, these universities continue to have uh, bumper crops, so to speak, of freshmen and, and graduates, et cetera. So it feels like eh, perhaps this degree technical talent is going to work out. And yet there seems to be a gap in the traits. How are, are you guys engaged in the community to help support that? How, what's going on and what can people be doing to help support the trades? Because those, again, as you say, there's a competition for talent and it's not just, it's not just the engineers. It's right. The electricians. Exactly. Well, I do, at some of our sites, we actually are looking with working with like community colleges or vocational uh, institutions that are local that we're saying, OK, hey, maybe we can partner and maybe we can have interns come in or maybe somebody can do like a trainee trainee program. And it, it benefits both of us. You know, it helps the, the local community college or vocational institute with the training of their students. It helps us introduce students to our company and they say, hey, you know, I kind of like this. Maybe I want to come work for this company. I, I really want to look at how we expand that broader because uh, in some of my previous companies, we actually had uh, more formal relationships and that developed kind of, as you mentioned, a pipeline. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a pretty good pipeline of engineers coming into the industry. It's these vocational uh, technical degrees that uh, really there may not be as strong a pipeline and we need those individuals as much as we need the engineers. Yeah. Interesting. It's a dilemma. I would tell you, you know, Georgia, it's a dilemma because as a parent, I'm, I'm pushing my kids to college, um, oh, yeah. right. Directionally. And yet I also recognize that, Hey, there is a lot of non-degreed skilled talent and roles and opportunities available. Um, that we need people to fill. <laughs> I don't know who it's going to be though, George. <laughs> I, 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 I remember uh, about, you know, 10 years ago, I was down in the Gulf Coast and uh, we were really, there was a big push for capital projects and we were looking for welders, pipe fitters, and you just couldn't find them to staff these big capital projects. And those individuals, if you had a little experience, could make six figures. And I'm right. thinking, wow, I, you know, when I graduated from college, six figures was kind of like a, a ultimate goal. And these it's like the Holy Grail. You're hoping to get it's there. The Holy yeah. Grail. And these individuals now it's 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 a unique skill set and it requires some experience. But those individuals have been and will continue to be in high demand. Yeah. Interesting. Good stuff. So what's next for you guys, George? When you look ahead at the rest of 2023 going into 24, what do you What's on your horizon? So when we think about, you know, kind of the horizon right now, we're in our uh, strategic planning process. And so we're looking at, okay, what's the next five years look like? And, uh, you know, just like I mentioned earlier, uh, whether it's a small company or big company, you're looking at how do I grow? So we're looking at, you know, where, where, where we want to grow. And we are, as, as we mentioned, very strong in some of the mature industries but we also recognize the trend and where companies are going in terms of being more green, more sustainable. And so how we grow with them and where are those opportunities? And we've got several that we're looking at that will you know, say, OK, this is where we want to grow. We think this is a good growth uh, area for us. Cool. Awesome. I can't wait to see what that looks like for you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, George, thank you for joining me today on The Chemical Show. This has been really awesome to have this conversation and learn more about you and about uh, eco services and where the industry is going. So thanks for joining us on The Chemical Show. Thanks very much, Victoria. Enjoyed having you. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Keep listening. Keep following. Keep sharing. And we will talk to you again soon. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.